on this episode of Southern Fried Geekery. If you're not an asshole, your kids won't be an asshole. WWE SmackDown. It's a non-televised. Uh, it used um, to call them house shows. Now they're just yeah. live events. Yeah, they're they're not, it, it won't be on TV. Verizon. They're doing it at Verizon. Yeah. Well, that'll be fun, man. So one so, o'clock, probably a couple hours long. So, so is it usually named talent at those things? Or? Oh yeah, they've like the, the big uh, the main event is a fatal five way match with like literally every top star on the SmackDown brand. Because right, the current champion AJ Styles won his title at a house show. Non televised, and they wow. showed stills on the actual television show. Wow, very so, cool! It's a great way to pimp out hey, yeah. come to live shows. Shit actually does happen. Yep, I mean, the best one of the best shows I've ever been to, and I've been to a WrestleMania, yeah, was a house show with Hulk Hogan. The first only time I've ever seen him wrestle in person, and it was empty. And he his music hit, and you swore it was full to the rafters, screaming. And don't. And the only person who came close to that kind of pop was the Hurricane. I don't know if you were I watching him that Hurricane. era. I got and to the Green Lantern superhero, superhero in training yeah. that worked underneath him. Yeah, superhero in training. I went to a, I and mean, this was a while back, but uh, I got to go to one that was WWE and mm. got to go see uh, the, the Undertaker was there. Nice. And that's always been my guy back when I liked to ride. That's oh, my, yeah. So when I got my black belt, I fought a guy, not un, un, not Undertaker, but I fought a guy that You fought was, the Undertaker, you heard him. <laughs> <laughs> Legitimately as big as the big show. Oh wow. Jesus. That's yeah. a big motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe not, but it felt that way. Right. right. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll find the picture. When I did a uh, I did my first uh, first time I went to a wrestling school and did some training, there was a cop, I believe he's a Sherwood cop, legit like seven foot three. And I'm just like, I'm six three, you make me feel tiny. <laughs> Grab me. Yeah, so basically uh Larry I got me and Vanetta tickets. He's going with us as well. So uh, it's a late birthday present, but uh, very cool, dude. Yeah, always excited, excited to go. Always happy to go see some live wrestling. I'm excited for it for you. Well, let's get into the podcast. What do you think? Good, good. All right. Hey, everybody. That was really loud. Uh, welcome <laughs> back to our little podcast. I'm Caleb. I'm Sean. And I'm Craig. And this is the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. And I think, if I'm not wrong, this is our fifth episode. It is, Ooh. even though our show notes say four. They they do, but they <laughs> not on mine because I changed. Look, some <laughs> stuff and some things have happened. We're moving on. Yeah, and we're on top of things. That's that's how we got to roll with the punches. <laughs> you improvise, you adapt, and you overcome. Mine now says five. It does. I the, see it. He used the power of the pen. How's your week been so far? We it's not been very long since we last recorded. Anything fun happen? Anything cool in your life? You know, it's uh, been a pretty quiet week, which is kind of the weeks I like. I've been playing some <laughs> Monster Hunter. Last time Sean was over, he Monster showed me some Hunter. tricks. Uh, and uh, <laughs> You almost said tits. I, I saw it in your face. I showed him tits. <laughs> I almost said tips and tits instead of tricks. <laughs> Gracious. So, yeah, Sean showed me some tricks and tips, and I've been enjoying the game a lot more than I was previous to that. Yeah, and yeah, still talking about Monster Hunter. Yeah, that's what I've been doing besides work, playing Monster Hunter. But yeah, that's it's a great game, but it does really help if you have someone who knows how to play that show you just the little things yeah, that can it, improve it the change game. Change the game, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I've been playing Monster Hunter, and uh, still, I don't think I mentioned it yet on the podcast about my New Year's resolution. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah, uh, still doing that. Uh, my New Year's resolution because I do draw. I don't. I think I'm okay at it, and I used to draw a lot more frequently, especially when I worked at a tattoo shop. That's another story for another day. <laughs> but I used to draw a lot back then, and I've been out of it since. And I've been needing some motivation to draw again. So my New Year's resolution, and I made it public on Facebook and on social media, that uh, every day for this year, I'm going to produce a drawing. Whether it be big, little, doesn't matter. As long as I'm drawing a new original drawing every day. And I'm posting it on there, keeping people updated. A lot of positive feedback, and I appreciate every one of y'all who have been encouraging that's awesome, dude. Um, he yes. made his New Year's resolution Facebook official. He did. Yep. He really did. And Instagram official. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, what is this Instagram thing? <laughs> we got to talk about that later, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> and we probably need to get one for the show. That might be a cool thing that we could do. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, post pictures of the stuff we talk about. Uh, yeah. We're doing good just to have a Twitter account, though. 
Hey, segue into that. Speaking of the Twitter, guys, if you have listened to our past episodes and have liked what you have heard, and we hope you have, give us uh, likes. Give uh, leave us a review on iTunes, on Libsyn. We're on Google Play, we're on Stitcher, wherever you find us at, the many places that we're available. If they have an option to to give us any ratings or to give us a review, we would really appreciate it. It lets us know how we're doing. It's able to, to give us an idea of how to judge ourselves and and what we're producing for you guys. It also kind of extends our reach a little bit. So if you have a certain number of likes on on iTunes or you have a, a good rating, they they help promote you. Uh, and we would like that because we would like to get out to more people. Just for the fact that we would... We enjoy doing this, and we enjoy reaching out and talking to other people who are into geek culture out in the world, making new friends, and you know, just getting together for good conversation. You can also email us at southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. You can reach out to us on Twitter at SFG Podcast. Uh, I keep an eye on that, so I'll know when you do, and I know when you say things you shouldn't. I'm like weird Santa of the geek world <laughs> but um that's where we're at but uh well i'm glad you guys had a good week so far i've had a good week it has been a rough day though not gonna lie it's been long <laughs> i've been at work all day uh today's job was not easy so i'm really glad that we're hanging out recording this podcast i'm gonna eat some delicious thai food that you guys can't see or smell and i'm gonna drink some wine because i'm grown <laughs> and i'm gonna <laughs> hang out with my brother because i can right and it's gonna be better so it's been a few days since we recorded the last thing. Anything news-wise happen? Yeah. Um, during our last episode, we talked about Brian Michael Bendis and the rumors he was taking over Batman and rumors that he spawned and spurred on himself through his Twitter account. But as it turns out, I don't know, he probably will still do a Batman, but he is officially taking over Action Comics and Superman. I think it got misconstrued a little bit when it got blasted out to the fandom. I think he's writing a Batman story for something. Maybe. I don't think he's doing a Batman ongoing book. That may very well I think, be it. you know, because people have been wondering what he's going to be on. And I think it was at just at the perfect time, and everybody was like, oh, Batman, like what? And then, you know, Tom King's doing such a good job, everybody got a little scared, and they were like, oh, no. Speaking of that, scared, yeah. I'm happy as I am that Bendis is going to be writing some good books, and he would probably do a very good Batman. I'm glad Tom King's not leaving the book just yet. Yeah. Which... Is a little bit how I feel about Action Comics and Jurgens leaving Action Comics because he's been just nailing that. Book. Oh, really? Because I'm not reading that book, but yeah, yeah same it, feeling. It's bittersweet because I really want to see what Bendis can do with Superman, but I really don't want to see Jurgens leave. I don't either because I'm really enjoying that story. If you've been reading it, it's a, there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of Booster Gold involved, and they've been traveling through some time and doing some kind of crazy stuff with Superman history and lore. It's a good time. I, I'm sad to see Jurgens go, but I also think Jurgens probably volunteered. I don't think it was like because Jurgens is a good enough writer and he's got enough clout. I don't think that Bendis just kind of stepped in and swung his dick around and said, "I'm taking your shit." Well, I think Jurgens probably said, "Yeah, it's, I've, I've had my run. It's been a couple years now. I'll bounce." I, I, I feel like that they probably have something lined out for Jurgens. They're not just pulling him off of a book and on a book that's been that successful. I don't know dollar wise how successful it's been, but as a person that doesn't read Superman. It's been a great book for me to read. Yeah, I, I've completely enjoyed it, and I actually enjoy reading Superman, which is something I can say has never been the case before. Right. right. Yeah, I'm I'm not a Superman fan either, and I'm I'm not on the main title. I am reading Action though, and I'm really enjoying it, and mainly because of Dan. He's a great writer. He's got a lot of heart, and he puts that in there. I actually like the book more so because of the. Uh, the supporting cast that's been going on right now. Um, this new, it's not, I don't know if it's a new Lois Lane because I don't have a lot of experience, but her doing this whole thing is rad. So I can explain the Lois Lane thing, at least as far as DC's explained it. Right. So during uh, New 52, the Superman and Lois Lane that were there were the New 52 continuity. Mm -hmm. The post-crisis Superman and Lois Lane and their son John were there and living on a farm, staying out of the limelight. Mm -hmm. And when New 52 Superman died, he felt like it was his time to take back up the mantle. So what you have is post-crisis Superman now in the role of Superman, taking back over the role right. that, that New 52 Superman had. Now, as far as Lois Lane goes, Lois Lane had become Superwoman mm -hmm. through the... Kryptonian cancer that killed Superman. <laughs> she died in issue one of Superwoman. So there was no Lois Lane. So it was easy 
to slide Lois Lane into the old Lois Lane spot. She just went back and started writing again and pretended she was her, cut her hair, made herself look younger because post-crisis Superman and Lois Lane were a bit older than the New 52 Superman and Lois right. Lane, so, or Clark and Lois or whatever. That's how they did it. Timeline, Joel. <laughs> you know, it's comic books, and sometimes you just have to say, okay, it's perfectly feasible for some explain, unexplained reason that there were two Supermans on the planet, and one of them was content to do nothing. Yeah, I don't know why <laughs> we apply physics and reality to one parts of books about guys who soak up sunshine and fly in underwear. Because what else will we argue about then? That character can't be black, but he can soak up sun rays yeah, yeah. and shoot eye beams. <laughs> right? Uh, you know. I was recently informed <laughs> that, uh, I'm going to brutalize his name as big of a fan as I'm going to say his full name, is that uh, Echiro Oda, the creator, writer, artist of One Piece. Can you say that like slower because I'm Southern and don't know what you just said? <laughs> Echiro Oda. Okay. That's as close as I think I can get his name properly. I always just refer to him as Oda. <laughs> Creator of One Piece. It was reported that he makes over 3.1 billion yen a year, which translates to about $26 million a year he is making off his little book. And it's, that's not just, that's huge. Like, and I think even comparable to novelists, uh, Western comic book that, writer, like he's making more than most. There's not a lot of people in any type of humanities craft that I, <laughs> I consider writing and, and art. Yeah. that are making anywhere near that. I mean, there's a very few American-style comic writers that are making in the millions, and when they do it, their name is attached to a television show or a film franchise. That is more than Stephen King or J.K. Rowling made off of their books last year. Wow. And, like, because I, I know he's published through a comic book company, uh, Shonen Jump, and so I don't know how much of that is before or after their cut, I'm sure, but I can tell you, like, for my... 18 days I spent in Japan last year, like, One Piece is everywhere. Yeah, it's a phenomenon, and it's a phenomenon here. It's big here, but, like, I'll even have to do due diligence where it is, because even he's admitted to it. So, probably enough, uh, Naruto has actually more American fan base than One Piece does. We need to fix that, listeners. <laughs> Read more One Piece, watch more One Piece. But, yes, he's doing very well. I'm very happy to hear it, and just hope he doesn't work himself into the grave before the series ends. So, another thing that happened this week, and this comes out of Hollywood which I don't know how either of you guys feel about the Harry Potter films. Big fan. Okay, I, I love them, and I've, okay. I've and read the all the books. And yeah, the books. Okay. So I was going to say, you know, regardless of how you fear, feel, they're part of geek culture, and it's something when a new movie comes out, it's a big event. Oh, yeah. I, I love the original series. I haven't paid any attention to the new prequels. I don't know if you guys have or not. I haven't well, had a chance, but I do want to see it. I've seen the, the the newest prequel, I guess, that came out a year or two oh, Fantastic ago. Beast. So, yeah, so Fantastic Beasts. So they're Beast. currently filming the sequel to the prequel. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Albus Dumbledore's in this movie quite a bit. After the movies came out and after everything was done with the original series, J.K. Rowling came out and, and stated that Albus Dumbledore was a gay man. Yeah. And it and never it, was, it wasn't addressed in the books or in the movies because it, his sexuality did not matter I, to the I right, want to that say, story. Memory may be a little fuzzy. I want to say it was kind of implied. That's why fans were asking her, and she was like, "Yes." Well, it it was implied if you read between the lines. Maybe with like his, maybe his relationship yeah. with the wizard that I can't remember his name that had the uh, sorcerer's stone. Yeah. It was implied that there was possibly some romance there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so yeah, she came out on Twitter and she announced that he was in fact a gay man. Yeah, I remember and when so, that happened. Right, so now the big to-do is that they are not going to address his sexuality in the new movie. I have thoughts and feelings on this as a straight man, but I'm really interested to know what Caleb's thoughts on this are. I have to check in with my overlords. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, it, like, I haven't been, I haven't actually heard much of, of the controversy. So, just so I get my bearings straight, the controversy is that they are not addressing his sexuality in the show. Yes. So, it's, you know, obviously one side of the group is like, fine, leave it out. And then one side is like, well, you know, it would be beneficial to the community if we had his. So, so you know, I'm just curious as a. You, how does that play into your thoughts on it at all? So, my 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 thinking behind it, I'm not offended at all that they're not showing his sexuality any more than I would have been if they had have shown his sexuality. Um, as 
the people who make these these films, who write the books, are artists. They have a direction. Would it be great to have a powerful wizard who I see part of myself in in that wizarding community to know what you know what the nuances are of same sex relationships in the wizarding world? Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be dope. But if it's not part of the story, if it's not integral, if they're not going to do a love story, um, if they're not going to have it intrinsically tied to the plot. If it's just going to be a by mention of, you know, you're a wizard, Harry, and I'm a little gay, and also none of it matters, then then there's no point. I, I don't need a, I, I don't need a drive-by gang. Kind of <laughs> is what I'm saying. I, you know, I, I would I would love to know a story there if it is part of the story. And I love the fact that J.K. Rowling came out and said, yeah, I, I was envisioning a gay man when I wrote this character, but it never was necessary for me to write that. I think that's amazing. So not only as a writer, but as a, a gay man, I look at these things and I kind of, I put myself in those shoes if I can. There's actually a lot of people, uh, there a lot of characters that a lot of people are familiar with that were written with being gay in mind or with being black in mind. There's actually, I don't know if it's been verified or not, but... When J.K. Rowling was writing Hermione, uh, I think is how you say Hermione. her name, Hermione, um, she was envisioning a young woman of color, a black British woman, yeah, um, <laughs> with that, you know, a black British girl with that in mind. It didn't translate like that, but she never put it in there. And a lot of people were upset when that came out. But if it's not intrinsic to the story, then I don't, and, and, and sometimes it needs to be, but in these cases they've been written and it wasn't, so obviously it didn't need to be. Right. Um, you, you know, like I was saying, a lot of characters are written with with minority groups in mind without it saying. Our buddy Justin Jordan, uh, he wrote a book... Spread? Spread, yeah. It was a horror comic. Yes. <laughs> Lots of blood, gore, and some weirdness happening. We were talking uh, about six months ago, and no, he was written... Justin had a, a gay man in mind. No, no is actually a bisexual man, uh, I think, specifically. But it's not in the story because it's not important to the story. Yeah. There's no there's no love story there. There's no, there's no reason he needs to. But there's also lots of films, lots of books, lots of comics where they never take time out to tell you that a character's straight. That's the weird part about being a minority, especially a minority that, that is so niche. Uh, you know, I think... On paper, maybe 10% of the population in the world are openly gay. And anytime there's an, a gay character, people expect us to, like, fire a flare in the air and come out shitting glitter or something. I'm not sure how that works. Cause I'm a, <laughs> Doobing glitter and yeah. rainbows. <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, full disclosure, I'm a terrible gay man. I listen to metal, watch football, uh, love some comics. I just happen to be really attracted to my little fuzzy bear of a husband. No. Um, and I <laughs> love him dearly and forever. The only reason I'm quick to out myself a lot of times is because I do live in Arkansas and I'm a white male. And we live in a very religio-conservative state. And I really don't like being in line at the grocery store or to in meeting new people and them just assuming I'm kind of the same, honestly, a big, I have the same bigoted thought process as they do. And I really don't like it when people look at me and low-key, like, drop racism and homophobia. So when I do meet new people, I'm like, oh, by the way, let's just go ahead and cross this bridge right now. I am married to a man, so, you know, don't look at me and think that I'm going to join you in uh, your passive-aggressive hate march of somebody that you don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> that, that got a little bit off-key, off, off key, but I'm, I'm not upset by it. I, I, I would love to see a gay wizard in there. It doesn't necessarily have to be Dumbledore. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, my thoughts on it, now that you've spoken yours, my thoughts on it revolve very much around the same thoughts we had about Starfire right. last week. That if it's part of the story, then it should be in the story. If it is there to help the author when they're writing that character to come in their mind, they've got that person as a gay character so that they can write that character in a certain way or have certain effects that would change their personality because of things they've gone through as being a gay person, then I can understand that too, even if the sexuality is never explicitly stated in, a, in the movie or the book or whatever media. As a straight man, as you said, it doesn't matter because there's so many times that there's straight people in movies or books that they don't talk about their sexuality. Now, the one thing about it I think that's causing a little bit of a 
trickster is that the the bad guy in this movie is his ex-boyfriend. So they think that there should be some mention of that. I don't know that it matters to the story. I think you have to reserve judgment till you watch it. I'm not going yeah. to say either way because I haven't watched it. Right. Um, I, or I haven't read the script. If I watch the movie and it does feel like they're going to be there, I'm going to come out and say, hey, well, and this is the one thing I want to say. I don't want people to misconstrue what I said earlier as me saying representation doesn't matter because it absolutely does. It, does. it 100% does. I still remember the first time I saw a gay character on TV that I could relate to. It was a guy named Vince from Will and Grace. He's a, he was a New York cop that was Will's boyfriend. He walks in. There's nothing stereotypical about him. He's a police officer. He has a deep voice. He good looking guy and happens to like Will. I said, hey, that's me. Like, th- like I never saw myself in Will. I never saw myself in Jack. I never saw myself in any of the characters. I finally saw myself in him. Remember the first time I read Midnighter in comics, I was like, holy shit. Like, that's that's me. And that's an amazing feeling. Funny because I can never see you as a cop. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you're not wrong. Uh, but, you know, I finally saw somebody that had the personality traits that, that I understood. And that was even back when I was in the closet. I mean, like, yeah. that was a long time before I ever came out, but I still had the wherewithal to say, hey, that's me. And that's an empowering moment. Um, and if it comes out and they, they should have put that in there, then I'll come back and say, hey, you know how I said that, that they didn't need to? Then I was wrong because in this movie they needed to, and something was lost because of it. Again, I think you're right. Wait until we see the movie. Yeah. Like, I guess, in short, if it's not integral, you don't need a fluff piece. You don't need them just to be like, hey, look, this is for you. If it's not integral, it just it feels false. It feels like forced. they're just... Yeah, forced. Right. That's the better word. Is that, would that be fair? So, like, that's kind of how I feel about it, like, with different things. And, and like, speaking of the straight male, I, I, I don't think, know if I feel the same, but, like, you know, sometimes things feel like forced or just, like, fluff. Or like, hey, hey, this particular group, we're just showing you this little thing that we're not going to acknowledge anything else. It feels fu- fake to me. I think I think you're on point in the spirit of what it is. Right. <clears throat> I'm not crazy about the word forced and not because it's from you. Right. Because there is a large segment of the geek community that anytime any new character is presented or talked about or created that's not a straight white male all I hear on Twitter or on oh, Facebook for like four days is forced diversity. You know, it's a bunch of douchebag I, I get dudes. That. Yeah, um, that's, that's not you know that's not. What no, I no, no, I, no. I don't think that's that's where you were going with it all. Um, uh, it's I, one of those things. It's just the vocabulary of it all. Oh, indeed. Um, and I'm trying to think of like an immediate example that I had in mind, but my mind's going blank. So we'll just move on. But yeah, honestly, Jude Law's playing Dumbledore, and. Johnny Depp's playing the other wizard that I can't think of his name. They and need I think to be there's gay. a lot of people that they are, need that to want gay. to see a Jude Law. <laughs> Forget Johnny everything Depp. I just said. They sex need, scene. Not only do they need to be out, there needs to be at least three sex scenes. I need to go direct one of them. Let me write this. Please call me. I'm available. I will quit everything I'm doing to write Jude Law topping. That changes Johnny the whole Depp. thing. Everything it? I just said was a lie. Faking, faking right now. But no. I, yeah, you know, just 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 kidding about all that. But that's where I'm at with it. But I will agree with you, uh, at least as far as Jude Law. Like that would have made much as I love the Sherlock Holmes films with Robert Downey. They were the best couple in the entire movie. He's a pretty man. Like <laughs> he's not even what I'm necessarily into. I mean, like I said, my <laughs> husband's a little fur burger of a of a bear, and <laughs> I, that's my thing. But Jude Law is pretty man. Oh yeah. I don't necessarily even have a type though. I don't know. You like what you like. Yeah. Because I'd also go for Tom Holland in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, they got real gay real quick. This wine, hey, we ain't ashamed. The, the, I, this this wine is good. We, we talk about what we talk about it. <laughs> um, so the only news that I really have, I had some other things, but they all kind of paled in comparison to the minor freakout slash heart attack slash exist, existential crisis. I had last night um, when I saw the news that Stan Lee had been rushed to the hospital for shortness of breath um, and some other things were going on. That man's my hero. I don't I don't care what anybody says about all the background noise between him and Jack Kirby because there's a lot of things that they don't know. There's also the editor in chief from that time who I think is the real villain of that story. But you can Google that information. Stan Lee is a saint to me. Stanley invented helped invent the characters that I love. He I, I, there's so much of my life that is centripetal to Stanley. And so I know he's an older man. I know eventually something life is going to happen. I just am not ready for it to happen right now. And so when I saw that he went to the hospital last night, it was not a good night. I did not enjoy that at all. I am happy to say that I woke up this morning to 
the great news that he is out of the hospital and feeling just fine. He is doing great. Had a little minor scare, like most 90, <laughs> uh, 90-something 90 odd people do. Mm. Octogenarian's 80 years old. What would 90 I be? Uh, old as shit. <laughs> old, <laughs> uh, Sorry. Um, old as shit. <laughs> But yeah, he's he's doing a lot better as of today. And Stan, sir, we, we we love you and we thank you. And hang out with us for a little bit longer, as long as it's okay with you. If you didn't like me calling you old as shit, come on this podcast and fight me about it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> we're, it's gonna work one day. Someday we're gonna get Someday. that call. We're gonna get that email. <laughs> so you touched on it a little bit, his past and all of that. None of that. I mean, it matters to people. I'm sure. Okay. In and whatever happened, happened. I wasn't there. I don't know. What I do know is that the man has become an ambassador for comic books. Whether it's Marvel, DC, Image, he doesn't care. He's promoting a medium that we love. Yep. And for that, he gets my respect. Whatever happened in the past, how he got to that point, again, I wasn't there. I'm hearing stories from stories from stories of right. people no one sitting in this room and probably no one listening to this podcast was at any of those meetings. True. Because a book was written a few years ago that cast him in a negative light doesn't mean it was factual. And the same people that want to say that news is factual yell fake news a whole lot. Yeah, they really <laughs> do. I, I, I just don't want my hero to pass away. Um, <laughs> I get that. I, I have, you know, I have... One biological grandparent left. I've got a step grandmother that's been my grandmother my whole life. Um, I, I turned thirty this year. Those people are my heroes, and Stanley has been my hero since I, you know, since the first time I saw Spider Man on you know whatever cartoon channel, and since the first time I picked up any Marvel comic. Yeah. He was my hero when I didn't know he was my hero. Right. Um, well, again, just an amazing ambassador for the industry, for the medium that the three absolutely. of us love. And probably, if you're listening to this podcast, you love that medium. And the man will sign anything. He really will. If you'll pay him, he'll yeah. sign it. <laughs> I have a couple. I've got I've got a couple of Hulk books signed by him. Yeah. Um, well, I've got one Hulk book, and I've got one Tales to Astonish book because my, my characters, you know, I, I top five, but in no particular order. I mean, besides number one being the Hulk, Namor's up there with with everybody else, and. You know, you had Tales to Astonish, which was Hulk and Namor, so I have a lot of those books, and it's just fun mm-hmm. times. Nice. But I have a Spider Woman. Uh, the one that's the very risque cover that got um, all the of the Milo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I got that signed by him. <laughs> nice. Very high grade. I'm very proud of that book. That, well, that was a very high <laughs> yeah. grade book. Yeah. I think it's a nine, eight. And then I've got, uh, issue 52 of ultimate Spider-Man. He, he didn't work on either of those books and I don't care. But Spider-Man, Spider-Woman all came down the line from him. Yeah. I mean, so in one way or another, he had exactly. a hand in them. Exactly. At some point, we're going to have to talk about the time I got to go to Washington, D.C. for reasons not involving comics. While I was there, I went to the Library of Congress and actually got to. (laughs) I actually got to sit down for about an hour and a half with the original Steve Ditko pages from Amazing Fantasy 15. Oh, man. Um, And they are gorgeous. I have really, really good pictures of them. Uh, If we ever do get an Instagram, I'll put them up there. There's a lot of coolness on those pages, man. And you can see where Stan has written, uh, written. Steve notes. Ditko notes. Uh, There's one panel where there was a car, but you can see where they erased it. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, that's my news. Uh, Stanley had a moment, and Stanley is back. Ooh, so, awesome. um, so shout outs, guys. Uh, let's, let's, anybody got, you got anybody you want to say thank you to or to acknowledge in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, I'd like to, to acknowledge a good buddy of mine, uh, Matthew Reynolds. He, just another all-around nice guy from the comic industry. He's currently working on Rough and Ready under the accidental pseudonym of Mac Ray. And this is a funny story. If you haven't heard it, DC put Mac Ray as his working name on the book on Rough and Ready on issue number one because his email was Mac Ray at oh, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> And so they assumed that that was the pin name he was going under. So he's oh. just... He just Soaked it up and is running with it now. But hey. Yeah, he's working on that book with uh, Howard Chaikin. Regardless of what you think about Howard Chaikin, I really don't know much about the guy. I know he writes some controversial stuff sometimes. But according to Matthew, he's been nothing but a great mentor. Yeah. So, you know, give him oh, props. He's, he's good. Yeah, his, his stuff's good. 
So I, I want to touch on, like, we've talked about at least two different occurrences of controversy, maybe more in the first 30 minutes of this podcast. <laughs> I do want to say one thing about controversy. If you get people to talk about your work and talk about what you're doing, even if it's controversial, then you're a good writer. I agree with that. Uh, in some cases, there's controversy, kind of like some stuff that happened last week with a comic artist who is a known lots of things, but I don't want to get into too much of that. That's not good controversy. That has nothing to do with your with his work. With Howard Shake and the controversy involves his work. People talking about the merits of his work or talking about the moves that he made in his stories. That means that you're a good doing a good job as a writer because you're making people think. You're making people talk about hot topics. Not a plug for the store. But um, we will take your money on the sponsorship. <laughs> that that to me is the mark of a good writer. So, I mean. So let's talk about that book for a second since we went there. The name of the book is Divided States of Hysteria. It was very evident from the name of the book that he intended to stir up some controversy with it. And he did. But he's also working on Rough and Ready right now, (laughs) which is a Hanna-Barbera licensed DC story. A good buddy of mine is doing the art on it. Pick up the book and read it. Look at it. Let Matthew know how pretty the art is. And... uh, Enjoy it for what it is. It's a kid's story that's being adultized. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot it's of fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, mine's not comic book related, but as we said, shout outs to friends, family, and people who have uh, positively affected our lives. I haven't gone in a long time, but I used to be a part of a uh, dojo called the House of Kodenkan Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, I want to give a shout out to them. They're still going strong, though I haven't been able to attend. Professor Gary Jones is the instructor up there. Goes by Professor instead of the usual sensei. I, we always like to joke that he's a professor because he will teach you about dislocating your arm and then resetting it back in. <laughs> <laughs> He'll teach you how to hurt hurt someone and then fix them right back up and charge them for a, a masurfi. Uh, it's a fantastic jiu-jitsu dojo. It is uh, described as non-sport. It is old-school jiu-jitsu. Like, most of the stuff they will teach you in this class will not fly in MMA because groin shots are highly recommended every time. Really? (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, it was a very fun class. I enjoyed it. Sadly, time and money just forced me out of it. Uh, (laughs) But it's a really good class. If you live in Arkansas, uh, I highly recommend them. Uh, Phone number, if you're interested in it, is uh, 501-227-8880. They're located in Little Rock. Uh, give them a check. Check them out. Uh, they have a Facebook page, House of Coden Con Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, give them a like if you're interested in any kind of martial arts and want to learn how to, uh, you know, protect yourself in a very effective manner. So this is Jiu Jitsu that encourages groin shots. It does. I'm avoiding that one at all costs. <laughs> just, just to let everyone know. Well, for like, it's the primest example I like to give, and you know, it leads. If anyone's ever taken a karate class or any kind of basics, self defense, the first thing they always show you is someone grabs your wrist, right? Pop it out, and they show you the, the way to twist your wrist out of that grab. And that's effective because, you know, you can escape that way very easily. Their method is first a groin shot, pop your wrist out from their grip, hit them in the throat, back up, and be ready to knock up. <laughs> Do you have to say, I don't know you, that's my purse? If it helps you, kick them harder in the groin and then hit them in the throat even harder. <laughs> <laughs> I love that episode of that. It is fantastic. But, yeah. <laughs> so, this, the self-defense, there's three Ds. Distract, disengage, yeah. and destroy. Yeah. And so the first thing you do is distract them, and a groin kick or a groin punch is a very effective Absolutely. distraction. <laughs> and then you disengage by removing how whatever they have a hold of you while they're distracted. And then you step back and be prepared to destroy them if need be. <laughs> you guys are a lot scarier than I, I knew. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and uh, this is a side note from uh, because I was recently told about a story. I'm not going to name drop anything. In this class, because I haven't been in a while, I achieved an orange belt before I had to leave. And uh, went back one day, just a buddy of mine, Adrian Hill. Uh, I believe he has a second degree black belt in that class now. He, uh, I just went there, watched the class, hang out, see all the people again. And I talked to the professor, and I mentioned, like, you know, if I ever get the time and money to be able to come back, I would love to, and I'm willing to acknowledge it's been a while, that I would start back at a white belt. And he said, no, you made orange belt, we will honor your, your belt. Now, you'll get your refresher, but we're not dropping you back down. And a recent story I heard about someone who did need a refresher was going to be charged, had to work their way back up. Yeah. And it's just, it was about the money. Right. This, this dojo is about tradition, about the martial arts. It's the respectful thing to do is to honor somebody's belt. Absolutely. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I I totally agree. I want to give a shout out to another podcast. And I know I've done this several times. I really like listening to podcasts. It's one of the reasons that I 
asked you guys when we were first starting to talk about this to do the podcast and stuff and to get this thing moving and going. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of comics podcasts. I listen to a lot of uh, literature podcasts and just some other stuff in general. One of the best ones that I have found for me personally, I really dig it, is a comic. Uh, it's a comic book podcast called Comic Book Bears. It's specifically done by and geared towards gay men who are part of the bear community. Um, but they talk about all comics. It's not limited to comics that are just about that. They'll, they'll talk about anything from DC. They'll talk about anything from Marvel, from Image. They'll talk about any type of smaller publisher books. But it's run by a guy who has recently become a friend of mine. Um, his name's Mr. Bill Zanowitz. If you ever listen to this podcast, Bill, I, I, I think the world of you. And I really appreciate the, the knowledge that you drop every time you guys record. I mean, we're talking about stuff that came out last week. And stuff that came out, uh, you know, 30 years ago that he is just able to eloquently wax poetic about. And it's a pleasure listening to you and learning from you. I think it's really cool. So you should check it out. Even if you're not a gay man, you don't have to be to listen to that podcast. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, there may be some times that they talk about some things that you don't know about. And that's fine because sometimes you have to deal with the fact that some shit's not for you. But for the most part, you're going to have a really, really good time on that show. Um, that does not mean that... I want you to not listen to us. So please do. Um, and that's my shout outs for the week. Uh, yeah, Mr. Bill Zanowitz and the guys at Comic Book Bears. I was really hoping they were actual grizzly bears on that podcast. There should be. <laughs> it's not hurt. It just fell over. Um, uh, Comic Book Bears knocked the mic out. Yeah, there was a mic drop on Comic there Book was. Bears. There was. Yeah, it's literally like the mic dropped itself. Mic drop. <laughs> Bill, the mic dropped itself. I witnessed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, I'm drinking, but not that much. Last episode, we went kind of in-depth on some comics that we were reading, and that was really cool. But leading up to this entire thing, and specifically it kind of branched out from a comment on the first episode asking where this particular person should start. And, you know, we all branched out and said, I think the inevitable conclusion that there's no one place to start, and there's lots of places to start. It's one of those things that you, there's a plethora of, of open-ended picking points that you can jump into. But what we talked about is how a really, really good place to start is by collected editions, or trade paperbacks, or omnibuses, or original graphic novels that are all one story. And so we thought we'd get together and, you know, we talk about a lot of current comics, but let's talk about some trade paperbacks. Like, let's talk yeah. about some, gra some, some collected editions, some stuff that's out in print right now that you can buy co complete editions of, um, or you can go and find them online, or anything else, and they don't necessarily have to be for any particular time period or any particular genre. Like, this is kind of just an open-ended freeform. Uh, just quick side note, was a question I meant to ask when we originally discussed this, and it finally popped back in my head. Because we discussed the term graphic novel. I was just kind of thrown around. Yeah. But I think, like, if someone is wanting to use that term, with a fair description would be a book that originated in a collected volume. Yes. Never released in floppy. Always at, like, top of my head, uh, Habibi. Yes. And Blankets. They were, I, I believe they were always released as a collected volume. March is another March. example right. of that. Yes, that's what I consider a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. To me, when somebody calls a collected edition of floppies that have been put into a trade paperback or a hardback, and they call that a graphic novel. Right. right. The term does exist for an actual product. Yes, that... <laughs> <laughs> this is real people we're leaving it in this is real life we're not ashamed <laughs> oh Stephanie's got the giggles <laughs> Craig's wife is really adorable yeah. she's she, so, is. she really is she is she's great um, so, so yes but yeah I just wanted to kind of bring that up just so you know People who are used to that term, at least you can learn how to use it correctly or not be ashamed. Actually, <laughs> I have a little bit of a different thing to throw in on that. Because of what you said, it's never released in floppy. Right. I actually don't think that disqualifies anything from being a graphic novel. I think a graphic novel is a enclosed story that has a starting point A and a starting point B and never plans on it being anything outside of that. That's fair. And it's yeah. one contained story. Specifically, the reason I say that, The Watchmen came out in floppy forms. And originally, it was... The, the original creators never intended those characters to be anything but in those books. And we talked a little bit about those characters on the last episode. I would still say The Watchmen is a graphic novel because it has a starting point A and an ending point Z, and that's all it was. And so after they put it out in floppy form, they did collect it in the editions that are yeah, you can actually find a lot better.
So the I agree with Caleb's assessment 100%. It's either written to be in a graphic novel, to be a collected edition, or it's written as floppies to be eventually a collected edition. The Watchmen is a perfect example of that. Kingdom Come is a perfect example of that. That's fair. Because outside of those, those characters... Kingdom Come's characters exist in other format, but they are not um, existed in that form. Right. Other the, than the context Kingdom of the Come. story yes. was very, even though there were pre-existing characters, it was a very unique scenario. Yes. A trade pack paperback is a glimpse into a larger, longer arc. So uh, you've got Spider-Man happening, and they put out stories. Like we'll talk about when we talk about comics later on. Right. I'm going to talk about a book that's part four of a five-arc story inside a much larger, longer arc. When it comes out and it's just this story, it'll be called a trade paperback. It's not a graphic novel because there's more going on before and there's more going on after. Right. Okay. That makes that, that absolutely explains. Where my pet peeve lies with it is when you have people that are making millions and, and hundreds of million dollars off of comic books... In, reco- in making television shows based off of these comic books and refuse to call them comic books because right. graphic novel sounds more adult. Yeah, I'll say it. Walking Dead is a comic book. Yes. Walking Dead <laughs> is not a graphic novel. It's got over uh, like 180-something issues or whatever it's on right yeah, now. Like, like 223 or something. Yeah. yeah it's, it's up there. It's not a graphic <laughs> novel. It, I, I realize that you started the story with an idea, and you have a plan for how it's going to end, but it's not a graphic novel. <laughs> if it's went on more than a year, it's not a graphic novel. No. no. <laughs> You're writing a comic book, Kirkman. Yeah. I, and to be fair, I've never heard Kirkman say it. It's been the producers on the show outside of him. Oh. Oh. Uh, Nicotera. Nicotera. Yeah, yeah, he's the one that's real bad Sorry. about it. Uh, let me let me raise that. I apologize, Mr. Kirkman. You're filming a show about a comic book, Nicotera. Yes, but Mr. Kirkman, if you were offended by those statements, <laughs> you can come out of this podcast and fight us about it. <laughs> it's gonna work <laughs> one day. One, one day. day. Or the producers of Walking Dead, you can also come and fight us. <laughs> so let's talk about some trades. Or some graphic novels, or just anything that's been collected editions that you can either order right now, or find at your local comic shop, or check out on the library. Um, but these are things are you can buy them in big books. Usually they're close to twenty bucks, unless it's a huge thing that's lots of stuff. Then it might be more. But for the most part, they're going to run you from ten to twenty bucks. So why don't you start us off, Craigie? Okay, so the first book I want to talk about is Sandman, and. Uh, this is a book that can be collected in the hardback. You can buy three volumes to get the entire collection. Right. But I'm going to talk about the first trade pa- trade paperback specifically. It's entitled Preludes and Nocturnes. And, of course, Neil Gaiman wrote it with art by Sam Keith, Mike Dringenberg, and Malcolm Jones III. So let me just start by saying if... if if you're into comics and you haven't at least heard of Sandman, I don't know what comic book store you're going to, who you're talking to, but somebody needs to be recommending this book to you. Yep. At least try the first trade paperback. Um, I'm going to give you a little synopsis of what happens in the first trade paperback so you know what's going on. A wizard decides he wants to become immortal mm-hmm. and tries to capture death. And this is a living personification of death of the endless. And he accidentally captures her brother, Dream, instead. Without Dream, there's no one to run the Dream world. So humanity is no longer dreaming. Not just humans, but cats and everything else that exists in the world that would dream is no longer dreaming because there's no one to produce the dreams for them. So you can understand how that starts to affect people's sanity as a whole. Just to, to connect two dots, Dream is Sandman. These are Dream is Sandman. Yeah. Also named Morbius is yeah. his is his name he goes by. Okay. At least in the first trade paperback. Okay. But I'm not going to say any more than that cool. about that. So, uh, yeah, Dream. He's Dream of the Endless. That uh, there's seven of them, I believe, and I'm not going to try and name them all. But <laughs> they all start with D. There's Death, Dream, Desire, Destiny, and I, so on. Yeah, and so, and so on. Some of the best things start with D. 
<laughs> so they're all basically even above the gods in the DC universe because they operate outside of that existence of the DC god world. So uh, this is published by DC, but under Vertigo, correct? It was under Vertigo, but there is something that happens in one of the later collected so editions. So it has crossed over into Mainline. There, there is something that happens, okay. which I am not going to spoil for people. But there are a lot of people from the DC universe that show up oh. at this event in the Vertigo title while it was being written. So yes, it is very much a part. And not only that, currently in the Dark Knight's Metal mm-hmm. story that's out, a big part of it is Dream. Awesome. He, okay. he makes a cameo at the end of the first book, and he is a major player in this uh, Dark Knight's Metal. So. That was actually a really fun part of that book that made me really happy because overall I'm not enjoying that. Yeah. Um, I'm not either. Not a whole lot, but I'm reading it because Dream's in it because I love the Sandman book. So back to the synopsis is he's accidentally captured instead of his sister. Insanity starts to reign supreme because people are no longer dreaming and able to filter out the bad crap that happens to them in life. Eventually he, he escapes and then has to reclaim his kingdom that's been taken over. Cain and Abel live in his kingdom. It's great because they just basically go around with Cain gets mad at Abel and kills him repeatedly. It's it's a fun little thing that happens in the book. This this trade paperback, the first one, shines, in my opinion, both on its own as its own little story because it is a complete story that he it's his escape from being captured and reclaiming of his his dream world, his kingdom, so to speak. So within itself, it's its own story, but it also sets up beautifully the entire saga. If you haven't read Sandman, it's a slow burn. There, There's a lot of in it that you're going, it's just kind of boring. I don't understand. Why is it taking so long? What Will it get to its point? It gets to the point. Trust me. It's very much like Jonathan Hickman. It's very high yeah. concept. And so the thing about it is Neil Gaiman is a, he's a novelist. It is his first job. He does some television scripts. He does some movies. He does some comic books now and then. But he's a novelist. He sets things up way back at the beginning that play out, you know, 120 issues later. But you have to, you have to let it develop or else you're, you're just missing kind of the, the whole point of it. Yeah. You know, it, it's a... It's a slow burn, but trust me, the payoff, it, it's in my top five, if not my top one or two comics I've ever read. His his agent hit pay dirt whenever he basically titled Neil Gaiman as the master storyteller, not a master writer, because technically he's not. He's a master storyteller. Yes. That, and he I, I actually, I'm going to lose some nerd cred here. For those of you who who are wondering how important this book is to the overall canon of comics, um, I would argue that about 85% of all people who claim to be comics fans have this book in their top five stories of all time. Um, I've actually not read it. Uh, it's it's it, it, The subject matter has not been something that's ever grabbed me. It's something I'm going to do eventually, but something I haven't done yet. It's Like I said, it's, it's never been that type of story has never piqued my interest, but quality-wise, there's a reason that this is almost a cornerstone of an entire section of one of the two biggest uh, publishers. I only have a little bit above you on that because I have one (laughs) Sandman story and I only bought it because Yoshitaka Amano, the artist of Final Fantasy from day one, drew the book. (laughs) That's the only reason I bought it, but I did read it, so I've read a Sandman book. Well, um, (laughs) I've read one arc of the Sandman series. Um, I read the Overture. That so came that out. probably didn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Not not much. Okay, so that takes place after all of the events that happened in this story, but kind of retells some things. Well, from what I understood, it's actually a it's not a prequel, but it's it's setting up that entire thing. If I'm not wrong, it's a prequel told as a sequel. Exactly. Uh-huh. It, yeah, it, if you haven't read it, the original Sandman, first of all, by reading Overture first, you're blowing a huge surprise for Making yourself. Making a mistake. It's, um, I don't want to say too much, yeah. but don't read Overture first, people. I know it came out recently and it was easy to grab off the shelf. 
don't read Overture first. You are not the first person to tell people not to do with things that Caleb has done. <laughs> <laughs> read, read Sandman first. I promise. I would almost give a money back guarantee. Oh, if wow. you're a comic fan and you read it and you don't like it, I would almost say I'll buy your omnibus from you. If he won't, I probably will because I need to to, to own it. <laughs> um, I, I promise you, it's that good of a story if you let it develop, and it's not in and of itself necessarily a comic book in the traditional sense it's a story told through a comic concept through sequential art it's not necessarily a story that had to be told in a comic book awesome. also cool because neil gaiman is married to a member of a band that i was a big fan of way back in the day uh maybe you've heard of them the dresden dolls hmm. Never I heard not, of it? I have not. I have, the name sounds familiar, but... Oh, Dresden Files. No, that's what <laughs> I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, he is married to Amanda Palmer from the Dresden Dolls. And that's... I was kind of a goth kid at one point in time. And I'm even so though, shocked. <laughs> right. <laughs> even though that, that band was kind of after... Oh, it was kind of before me. Um, I'm still a fan of bands like The Cure, The Cult, and the Dresden Dolls have a place in there as well. So, and they have a beautiful baby together cool. who I'm pretty sure is going to do amazing things in life because how can you not when your mom's Amanda Connor, <laughs> not Amanda Connor, <laughs> it's Amanda Palmer. Different Amanda, <laughs> just as talented, <laughs> very talented. <laughs> and Neil Gaiman. Uh, yeah, I will go next. Um, so I actually want to talk about a book that I'm willing to bet neither one of you at this table has read. I thought you were grabbing My Hero Academia. <laughs> I, I wish he was grabbing it, but no. No, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not grabbing my hero academia. I'm taking a drink of wine, so I'll quit choking to death. I don't have the shakes anymore. <laughs> um, no, I, I want to talk about, and this actually is an original graphic novel. This is a good example of a of a book that there is nothing to come before this. There's nothing to come after this. It's it's a complete story, and this is a book that I don't think not only you guys probably haven't read unless I've told you about it. I'm, I don't think a lot of people know about because it's not what you would traditionally think of when you think of comic books it's more of it's graphic storytelling it's also realistic fiction so this story uh, just jump right into it it's called adrian and the tree of secrets uh, it's a story by a guy named hubert he's kind of he's one of those people who only has one name so maybe he's the share of of comics like this but it's illustrated by a lady named marie caillou she's french and the book actually is italian originally and it just got translated last year it is phenomenal it really really is I'm trying to think of the best way to put this it's the story that that's dear to my heart because it's about an adolescent kid who knows he's gay who realizes he's gay and realizes that he's different from everyone else and you know big shocker the gay guy on the, on the podcast is going to tell you about a gay story <laughs> um you don't have to be gay to enjoy the story it is so human mm -hmm. um so nuanced and and beautiful The i kind of want to get off starting i want to start off talking about the art instead of telling about the story first it's done digitally which is something i really don't like because that means i can't go buy the original pages mm -hmm. it's got a very muted color scheme the colors are vibrant but they're muted they're you know there's some there's lots of blues and pinks uh but there's no sheen to them it's all done on a very matte kind of spectrum um, so the story starts off, the kid, he's getting ready for school, he's doing all these things, you know, he lives with his mother, uh, the father figure is not in his life, he's kind of a nerdy kid, he wears sweater vest, has glasses, you can kind of just see by his disposition, he's kind of unhappy, just generally, and, and you don't know why. He starts off on his way to school on the first couple of opening pages, and he's on the bus, and he's riding, and he, they pass a bridge, and on this bridge in the background, you can see a figure just kind of leaning over the edge, looking down. And he just kind of looks he, like in the storytelling by the art is so good that there's actually no word balloons on this page. There's no there's no narrative. It's just he looks over and it kind of goes to a close up of the guy looking down. And then you see the main character, the boy walking by. And you just know, you, you know, that this person has just jumped off this bridge. This 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 person who doesn't have a big part in the story just committed suicide. And you don't know why, but you do. You, you know why? Because of the context the, the any time in a book an art can tell you context that's something that's just magic that's something that like 90 percent of comic artists who are professional and engaged in the, the industry today they can't do 
Marie Calhoun does that. She she tells the majority of the story and the majority of context. Well, so the book goes on. Later on, you learn a little bit more about what happened with the kid who jumped, turned out to be a kid, turned out to go to this kid's school. All the kids are gossiping about it. Uh, the, the boy's friend comes up, and she's a kind of a goth chick. She's wearing a black hoodie, has a little emo over happening. And, you know, they're friends and doing their thing, but there's, you can just tell that there's something going on. Like, there's been a change in this child's life. There's, there's some, there's some recognition of some things that he's not comfortable with and not comfortable in dealing with. He goes on through the story to, you know, you realize he's not the best in sports. He goes to a Catholic school. His mother is very, very religious. Got a lot of things working against him. I, I say working against him. In this story, these are a lot of things that are working again. <laughs> you know his mother's not going to be accepting of him. You know the school is not going to be okay with his sexuality and their religious teachings. The other kids are not going to be welcoming him into their circle. There's a lot of bullying going on. He gets bullied on the field. Somewhere in the middle of the story, the kid finds out he's not alone. In fact, not only is he not alone, he, he gets a crush on one of the popular kids that you generally assume is a straight kid. And that happens in a lot of kids' lives. That happened in my life. I know, I've been there. Like That's one of the reasons I love this book, because I see so much of myself in this kid. Uh, I've been there. I know what it's like to, to have emotional attachments that aren't what you think should be normal about your friends as, a, as an adolescent, a young adolescent boy <coughs> who's different and who's not a member of the in crowd. But like sometimes happens, the feelings are actually reciprocated a little bit. The, the the cool kid starts being nice to him and starts giving him rides home on a scooter so he doesn't have to walk. They go out and they share cigarettes together, which is something you shouldn't do, kids, of, of any sexual disposition. Cigarettes are bad. Um, <laughs> but it's a way, it's like a bonding moment for them. They're doing something rebellious that's just rebellious enough that they're able to make that connection that there might be other rebellious things that they could do and do <clears> together. Now, I make it sound like this book could possibly go some places that it doesn't. It does flirt with the idea of these two adolescent boys having a sexual interaction. It never happens, though. It comes real close. It comes close enough that it makes me uncomfortable, honestly, as reading that, but I think that's what art should do. There's a scene where these boys are in their treehouse. They're smoking a cigarette together. The colors are, again, beautiful. The sky is actually this this yellow hue that, that matches their skin tone. And then the cool kid, and I'm not saying names on purpose, I want you to go, obviously the main character is Adrian. The cool kid reaches over and kisses Adrian. But I don't want to tell you who the cool kid is, you'll figure it out when you read the book. And of course he's taken aback, and they're both kind of embarrassed, but then Adrian kisses him back. And so you're like, hey, yeah, winning, this is awesome. <clears throat> Things kind of progress a little bit. And the part that makes me uncomfortable is there is a scene where the crush gets a little handsy. Um, you can see him reaching inside Adrian's shirt, which is unbuttoned. And at one point in time, he goes to reach down his pants. And the reason it makes me uncomfortable is because it never, it never establishes the exact age of these kids. At the end of the day, though, I don't care who you are. Your teenagers are having sex. Don't fool yourselves. <laughs> it's a scary thought for parents. I know it is, but it's a thing. Like the minute puberty happens, hormones kick in and your kids are thinking about sex. But like I said, that it never happens. Adrian backs him off a little bit. He's like, hey, I'm not ready for this, which is also a really cool thing because it's breaking a stereotype that gays are over-sexualized and they can't say no to sex, which was neat. It was neat to see. But this kid kind of, he finds his legs, so to speak. He's like, oh, this is okay. I'm not alone in the world. I'm not weird. I'm not completely an outsider. So you see he's starting to, you know, he's doing some push-ups beside his bed, looking at himself in the mirror. He's flexing a little bit. He's gaining some, um, some self-esteem. Uh, and some positivity about his life. But it's a life that hasn't changed that much, and that's something that he also, again, is forced to reckon with. That's what is great about this book, is that it takes you on a ride. It takes you on a series of peaks and valleys. So start off in a valley, and then something happens, and it peaks, and you get really excited, and then, like life happens, it takes you back down to that valley. But then it peaks again, and it's it's a roller coaster of a, of a little graphic novel. Eventually, like what happens with most things, with real life is the story does not end the way you want it to, um, which is why I say it's fictional realism. This is not a fairy tale. This is real life. The boy rejects Adrian um, because some people find out about him, and Adrian gets sent to some counseling. There's a very religious pray the gay away moment. Um, his mother gets involved um, and is not accepting at all. His aunt kind of steps in as being that cool aunt who gets it and kind of 
kind of makes you wonder if she's a lesbian in some moments, but I don't think she is. And so for a little bit, there's uh, there's more peaks and valleys trying to walk you through these uh, these nuanced, nuanced moments of humanity and get you in the psychology of this young boy. You know, spoiler warning if you haven't read this book, and anytime we talk about comics, there should be a spoiler warning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not talking, we are giving full synopsis of these books. So Indeed. Um, the, the boy gets roughed up a little bit by some other kids, one of them being the kid that kissed him initially and started him down this process, and the book ends where it begins. Adrian walks to the sea, he stands in the ledge, he takes off all his clothes, he walks out into the water, and the book closes with a very gorgeous image of a sunset and the water not rippling. It's a tough book. I, I think I've, 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 I've admitted to crying on every episode of this podcast, <laughs> but that's what art should do. If art doesn't touch you in a way that it makes you mad, it makes you unbelievably happy, it doesn't hit you in the soul, then, then I mean, it doesn't make you giggle, it doesn't make you laugh and just experience these these vast amounts of joy, then is it really art? If I get out my Darth Vader doll, will you show me where that book touched you at? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, seriously, it, regardless of the sexuality of the, of the characters of that book, and their, it's a story of uh, unrequited love. Yeah. It, you know, he, he falls for someone, and they, they don't fall back for whatever reason, right. whether it's... Stay, I mean, the same thing could be said about a mixed marriage or a mixed relationship. Yeah. It's something that hits home for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. It does. And that's where I'm saying you don't have to have ever been a little gay boy to understand what this book is. You, well, you can have been a little straight boy. It's a human condition no matter what your sexuality is or what socioeconomic class you're in. Yep. I mean, that could be a big difference why people get an you know their love unrequited because the other person goes off because they're from the wrong side of the tracks right. or what you know there's so many things there's so so many different circumstances in our lives that that could happen for whatever reason and it's how we deal with it as a human that makes us who we are and you know it really speaks to the soul of humanity it's a story that pits number one it's a story and you know i'm going to go beauty and the beast here it's a story you know it's old as time it pits your humanity. Just don't sing it. Uh, you don't want me to. Um, <laughs> it pits your humanity against shame, yes. and that is at the crux of what this story is. It's at the crux of what kids who have had to come out as anything be that. You know, I went to a small high school of I th think the entire school had three hundred people in Arkansas. You know, Confederate flags in the parking lot and mostly white kids and very segregated. Even though segregation was quote-unquote ended, and we lived in a post-racial world, but I think there was one kid who came out as a lesbian in high school. I didn't come out until I was 20, but, you know, there was also a kid who had to come out and admit that she, like, was like a little black boy when she was a little white girl and wanted to date this black kid, and she had a shitty time. People made her life hell. People thought I was gay in high school and made my life hell, and that's a lot of the reason I kept that in. So it's anybody, like, you know, if there was a trans kid in there, I don't know about it. But anytime a kid has to come out as against the norm, that's what this book is talking well, about. Kids are evil. Yes. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, really I mean, are. They, they are. And I don't mean that, like, your kid specifically is evil, but kids in general are evil. But your kid, you, your kid may possibly be very evil. well. Be aware of your kid's actions. So, so you go to a public school and you do not fit into their idea of normal. I was a drama kid in choir. Right. I was straight, but I may as well have been gay. Yeah. Because you get made fun of the same way. Because stereotypes. Yes. And so if you don't fit their idea of normal... That's what happened. And, of course, I fixed that by switching schools and went into ROTC, which is just as much of a <laughs> stigma in a different direction. So, But you actually said something that I think segues into what I kind of wanted my final point about this book and the subject matter to be. You said kids are evil. Kids are sponges. Kids are extremely cruel because they don't have a filter, because they don't know when to uh, when to release what they've soaked up from the adults around them. And that's why kids are cruel. So the last thing I wanted to say on this, this is not necessarily just a story about what it's like to be a little gay boy. It also can be a story about what it's like to be a parent of a child that's different. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I say this, you know, like I said, I'm, I took this to a serious place because this is a serious book, and we're going to get lighthearted later on, but be careful what you say in front of your child. Uh, be careful what you say in front of other people's children because you don't know who that child is going to grow up to be. You Children are, believe it or not, in those little bitty tiny bodies, there are actually very big thoughts, very big ideas, and very big feelings. And when you say things about adults that you see around your child that are derogatory about their race, their gender, their sexuality, their their class, their status in poverty, their political beliefs on both sides, left and right, it doesn't matter. Your kids hear that and they pick it up and they either are going to use it to damage somebody else or they're going to use it to damage themselves. And as a parent, I cannot imagine what it's like to know that I've told my child that it's wrong to be who they are and they walked into an ocean. You know, the reality is, is that kids don't come with handbooks when you no. get a kid. There, there's no instruction manual to raise this kid. The biggest answer is don't be an asshole. <laughs> Pretty much in if, life. If you're, if you're not an asshole, your kids won't be an asshole. It, it's that simple. Absolutely. Or you're going to be better equipped to deal with your kid when he is an asshole. <laughs> if you're not. Yeah, I mean, but most, as you stated, most conditions are learned. I'm not a psychologist. You know, there's an argument over uh, nurture versus nature. And my daughter is a psychologist. Right. <laughs> and she will tell you that there's a little bit of both. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you do your job nurturing and there's some nature in there that's a problem because of bad genetics, <laughs> sometimes that nurturing will over overcome those bad genetics. Sometimes it won't, but sometimes it will. So just don't be an asshole. Treat Pretty your much. kids. Treat your kids good. Treat other humans good. Let your kids see you treating other humans good. And the chance of them being assholes are a lot less likely. This is why I love you guys. <laughs> uh, so I've had way too much of the feels on this book. But I do yeah. want to say, if you're offended by anything I said and you want to come on Twitter and scream at me about being a social just, justice warrior, bring your fight to me. If bring you're it. offended by anything that he said in that book, <laughs> go fuck yourself. We don't want you listening to our podcast anyway. Cheers. Truth. But seriously, argue with me on Twitter. I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> so who's next, guys? Well, I'm up next, and uh, can we lighten it up a little? I love that I'm <laughs> follow, that I'm following this amazingly deep, serious, <laughs> topical, and emotional book we just discussed. I'm about to bring that all down <laughs> because I'm bringing an amazing grindhouse style comic book called Body Bags. Nothing it, but class. <laughs> <laughs> it's from a uh, it's creator owned, written and drawn uh, by a man called Jason Pearson. Not an overly well-known author and writer, or author and artist that I'm aware of. I haven't heard many people talk about it. He has worked on books from Legion of Superheroes to uh, Global Frequency. And up until I actually did my homework, because I wanted to make sure I really pimped this guy out. I thought you didn't do homework. I don't normally, but I'm a big fan of this book, and not many people know about it. But he also worked on a little book called The Dragon, Blood and Guts. It was a miniseries about Savage Dragon. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> I have to, it was on my list. I didn't realize he worked on it. That's another tale. Body Bags is a uh, book. It was published in 1996. So, and it, it definitely feels that era. But it is a uh, this blood and guts action comic about a father daughter hitman team. They are, in fact, and it's one of the few books I can say I, that come to my mind where you actually have a Hispanic lead characters, uh, Mac Delgado and Panda. Yes, her name is Panda. And it's amazing. <laughs> okay, uh, basically, he is a hitman. He is an incredibly large man who can, who carries two giant knives. This is long before Machete came out. <laughs> Although Robert Rodriguez would make an amazing director for an adaptation of this book because it is exactly that style. It's if it's you great. do it, Robert Rodriguez. We only expect a small percentage. Percentage just acknowledgement. Acknowledge us. Yeah, just put our <laughs> names and you know, just put the. Southern Fried Geekery okay. name in, in the <laughs> I'm all about it. credit somewhere. <laughs> and if you don't like me telling you what to direct, come on this podcast and fight me about it. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, Body Bags, it's a brutal book. It is it caused a lot of controversy for many things, and I will just be up front about it in case none of it is to your taste. It's very bloody, very violent. Within the first couple pages, our lead quote-unquote hero who goes by clown face and professionally wearing a luchador mask with a smiley face on it, uh, stabs a crack, a pregnant crackhead woman in the stomach to kill the baby. 
God damn. Yes, it's, it is brutal. Like, what? Yeah. I was, you you want to see the page? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's no holes barred. Very look, he, he was there to do a job and to make his point across. Point out that she'd been smoking, she'd been snorting so much that baby was dead anyway. But, yeah, just so straight. We are not happy people, Sean. We're not. I said, I'm bringing it down. Craig's in here talking about a Sandman and the Master of Dreams, and we're talking about dead gabies and <laughs> crack machetes. I mean, in. <laughs> <laughs> in all fairness, I mean, everybody on the planet went insane because he was captured. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, <laughs> um, it, like I said, this is, but it is just, it's a no holds barred, very urban, very, because it's just in the streets of uh, Georgia. Yeah, it, basically, he is a hitman, sent on doing tasks. His daughter, Panda, comes down to live with her dad, and she's had an idea of what he's done. And gets kind of confirmed it, and then decides to join him. And he is dead serious. Like obviously, kill will stab a crackhead woman in the belly. <laughs> Just no, no shame. Uh, she is like the polar opposite of bubbly and happy. Like he wears like bulletproof kind of a shirt, khakis, chucks. I mean, he's a cholo, and it's amazing. I'm sorry, I just don't see that representation very much in books. Yeah. And this is, and it fits the story. It's not doesn't feel uh, oh, what's the word like they're just shoehorned in. Shoehorned in, like yeah. it's part of it. It's the style of the book, the writing of the book, it fits. Yeah. And, and as I was saying though, she discovers that she wants to join him because she has some psychotic tendencies as well. And uh, her out, she puts on her assassin's outfit, which is a cheerleader suit with a giant P for panda on it. <laughs> And she gets the biggest guns she can find to shoot people while her dad can throw a machete at, like through brick walls because he's that damn strong. <laughs> so what you're saying is her nature was to be a sociopath. She absolutely And her is. dad nurtured her into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why the mom took her away from him originally, but she found her way back. It's a circle. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a circle. <laughs> so like I said, very violent. Uh, and another little bit of controversy is she's a very uh, busty lass. And she is only 14. And it's addressed that that is her age. That is what it is. Some girls develop early. But that did raise some controversy, especially back in 96 when this was first published. So, fair so, warning if, like, that kind of weirds you out. And I get that. I'm not defending the choices. Uh, but at the time, uh, we can talk about that, though. At the time, that was part of the style that was going on. I mean, 1995 was one of Image's biggest years. I actually just found out from our buddy Bill Zanowitz that I talked about that I think it was either 95 or 94, for like that year, Image Comics actually outsold DC. Image Comics was part of the big two. Wow. It was yeah. Image and Marvel for just one year, and then DC stepped its game up. But so much of that art from that time was over-exaggerated uh, anatomy. Big yeah. shoulder pad. I mean, the women especially, everybody had giant tits and little <laughs> bitty waists and needed chiropractic treatment. I mean, and it's it's probably his style is very much we've discussed before a mix of American and you can de definitely tell there's some anime influence which considering when this was made anime wasn't as huge as it is now right but uh, it's like I said, very good it's this grindhouse bloody funny uh, this action comic and like I said completely opposite of what you just talked about <laughs> <laughs> these are not your parents Archie's comics we're talking no. about anymore guys I mean right. this these are adult content comic books and I'm, I'm and, sorry, Sean, oh no I'm oh, no worries at all uh, and it, it is it was a book I discovered later than when it was published I finally got it in trade paperback because I was I had no, even though it was published by image which I was a big image guy when it first started out never heard of it never it completely slipped under my radar just kind of seen some stuff about it online and checked out like the art like that they were the main characters were Hispanic you know, some representation yeah. of that and it's not a superhero book. It is It is a very much, with the exception, it's based a largely in reality with the exception of the fact that Clownface can throw a, a machete through a brick wall because he, <laughs> he is that jacked. Uh, it's very ground-based. It's just it's gangs, it's drug dealers, and they're taking them out. And that's a very good action, very good grindhouse. If you like that, it's no heroes, no good guys, no bad guys. They're all, they're all bad guys, should I say. Who doesn't like a good Grindhouse story? Indeed, I, mean, I still love those movies. I mean, we should we should do an episode where we talk about Grindhouse films sometime. Yeah, exploitation. That's definitely. I a, have an aunt that was in exploitation movies. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, was this the my grandma sister? I think you've told me about her before, but I didn't realize that she was in Roberta Reeves. She was in the Amorous Adventures of Don Quixote. 
Look it up. Your family's amazing to me sometimes. <laughs> oh, we're going to do a whole episode of FC <laughs> just family. on. And uh, uh, just, just a little side note on this thing. Pretty sure that's Hellboy walking around the streets of Georgia right there. In that that absolutely is it Hellboy. Is. <laughs> and, and also the guy in, has in, got a in also, the guy's got a Sin City shirt on. Oh, yeah. Like so this little... That's And this awesome. is just a crowd shot. Randomly inserted in. That's it's just... That's why I love low-level... Low con- right. that's, that's the wrong word. Even though it's put out by Image. That's why I love indie comics, though, because you'll see that. Um, and overall, they're not policed because they... Honestly, they don't have the, as big of an audience and as big of a monetary pool. So you can see Hellboy... I mean, streets. which uh, little side note, one of the first issues of Savage Dragons, either the main series or the mini series, I can't remember. He's dragging Lobo and Wolverine into the police. Yeah, <laughs> headquarters. Yeah, so Mike Magnolia is not going to go after at all Image no. for having a little panel with. Now there are some. If it was Batman, DC might, but putting another indie superhero or star or whatever in there. I don't think that's ever going to be an issue. In and, that and it's not like he's actually a character featured. It's a crowd shot yeah. where they got some people that look yeah. kind of similar. Yeah. Well, if it's it, even if this had been bigger name books at Image, I think he might have. If this was Spawn at, at this time in right. 1996, right. or if this was Wildcats, or if this was any of those books that had a lot of notoriety back then, he might have said something, but I don't think he's going to say anything in this about, book because it, it, even if it is indie, or even if it is image, it's still an indie book. So he's probably thinking about just loving that. Right. I, yeah. I am. I mean, it, it's a it's a cool little cameo, right? And just show you guys. I know the viewers can't see it, but like, I mean, just that summarized nineteen ninety six or what? That is panda. That's it. Yeah, that is like baggy yeah. baggy pants. Uh, and there's a up. fucking Watchmen reference. Oh, that's, oh yeah, like, and like I said, he her. His dad himself wears like I'll find a quick picture of the uh, him in costume. I I don't know if it's intentionally Watchmen, but I mean, you know, the smiley face is always a thing. Yeah, yeah. no, that's that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's completely '90s art in in a good way. Yeah, '90s art catches a lot of shit, but that's that's good yeah. '90s art. Uh, a future topic I know we discussed that we're going to be doing eventually is what books draw drew us into comics. Yeah, and especially creators. I'm a 90s kid. I mean, 80s was all about my cartoons, but my teens were 1990 and up, and that was the 90s era, and there's a lot to talk about there, too. It's easy to look back on an era and say, oh, that was all crap. The reality is, is guys, it wasn't all crap. No. There were a lot of comic books sto- sold in the 90s. Probably stole, too. <laughs> there were a lot of comic books sold in the 90s. And not all of that was from people just trying to collect and make a fortune off of comic books. We- and just remember, if you were a kid in the 90s, you could have been like me and bought New Mutants 98 for cover price off the shelf. There no. is that. I'm not even <laughs> the podcast because I'm mad. <laughs> but yeah, body bags, check it out. Good, violent fun. Uh, it's, it is actually available on Amazon. I checked. Nice. So, you know, go. You, you have to go through the Evil Empire to get some things. It, but always check to make sure your local comic book store can order it. Always, always check with your local comic shop. See if those guys have it, because they have a lot. Um, and, and you want to do that, because if we lose our LCSs, then honestly, my personal opinion is the industry is going to take a nosedive. I think that they don't LCSs don't get enough respect, and that is the keystone of, of the comics industry. So um, all of those books are good, and I'm almost 100,017% positive <laughs> that they are available and you should go pick them up. Um, and they came out from different eras, like I said, from 2017 to when did Gaiman start writing? Uh, oh, Sam hey. Hey. Or, yeah, late 80s, I believe. 80s. I'm, I'm going to fact check that. Yeah, it's the 90s. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, 1996 for body bags. Yeah, we are spreading the gamut here. That's over 30 years it's, for the comic. Yeah, so guys, we, we really loved these trade paperbacks. We spoke about them for a long time. It, we're going to do another trade episode because these are the things that we think that I feel like we can pass on to other people. Yeah. Is This is our love. Hopefully you'll pick these books up. Uh, Sandman number one, published December 1974. Is that, the, is that the Gaiman one? Uh, unless it was Sandman Mystery. No, no that's yeah, Mystery seven. Theater was something different. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, should be the uh, Sandman pseudonym, fictional character, Wesley Dodd. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's the other one. Oh. 
He was Sorry. A, he was a character before he was written by Gaiman. Gaiman just made him super popular. Well, uh, it was a different Sandman. No, you're right. Yeah, oh, that's Fedora and Mask. And, oh, okay. I'm going to find it. I'm We're going to cut this yeah. out. We're going to cut this out. Uh, the one you're looking for, he's got yeah. a I'll, bug I'll, face mask on. Sorry, there you go. So, you know. 93. Or no, 89. 89. 89 to 93 was the original run, I guess. So, yeah, we, we fully intend to have another conversation regarding trade paperbacks. And not just necessarily trade paperbacks, but books that we love, collected stories that we love from comics. There's so many good stories out there that we want to share with you guys. And some of it will be obscure. Some of it will be stuff that you've i'm sure you've heard of sandman there will be stuff you've heard of and there will be stuff you haven't yeah uh adrian and the tree of secrets is a perfect example of something you haven't heard of but it really affected caleb when he read it and he wanted to pass that on to you guys and that's what we hope to accomplish with these stories is to give you a little piece of what we love about comics yeah and next time i probably won't pick a book that's a piece of realistic fiction or that, touch, that that hits me emotionally the way it did, I'll probably tell you about some crazy sci-fi stuff. Um, I actually had four different things prepped to talk about, and I didn't know which one I was going to do. That one felt like the right one. But, you know, it's like asking a kid to pick out his favorite candy in the candy store. Well, he's going to go insane. And that's what it's like asking us to pick out the favorite collected edition of, <laughs> of thousands of comics that we love because we all have libraries that... Uh, are full of things that you know you're, you're asking us to choose between our children um <laughs> <laughs> well i had made i had quite a few options myself i went ahead and went with one that's not well known because i just wanted to spread that word next time might be something you'd at least heard of but maybe not well and the funny thing is as caleb says his next one won't be a a book that hits you in the soul no the a classy fiction, choice the oh realistic fiction. realistic fiction mine will be realistic fiction very cool Oh, nice. It'll be Hunter S. Thompson in the 23rd century. <laughs> so we'll just leave it at that as kind of a little tease for that. Yeah. Well, what about some books that are out now? That's one thing we want to do is we want to talk about books that just came out. Again, it's not always going to be about comics. We're, we're planning issues, issues because everything relates to comics. We're planning episodes that have nothing to do with comics. Um, but we are always going to talk about what is coming out in the upcoming week because we really like this shit, and I don't know how to put it that way. So I actually am going to go first, if that's cool with you, gents. Absolutely. Um, I kind of preempted what I was going to talk about on the last episode, which is out now. You sh it's available for download. You should go check it out. I'm a big fan of Greg Pak. I'm a big fan of most everything that that man does. I'm also a big fan of The Incredible Hulk, um, and it just so happens that Greg Pak writes The Incredible Hulk really well. And has written some of the, at least in the last 20 years, some of the most quintessential stories involving the Jade Giant. So what's cool is Greg Pak is writing the Incredible Hulk title again. It actually just went back to its legacy numbering, so we're up to issue 712, which I think is awesome. So I want to talk about issue 712, because it came out last week. I, I was expecting it to be good, and I was not disappointed. I, I think it's very good. There's a lot of Hulk fans that I've talked to just being in that community that aren't liking this book. The reason being, I'll give you a little bit of background, it's no longer Bruce Banner as the Hulk. Right now it's a guy named Amadeus Cho who's got a long history um, in comics. Uh, he was invented, he was created in the early 90s. He's a young, uh, young Korean kid, I believe. Um, but he's one of like the seventh smartest person in the world at this point. Um, he's a freaking genius. Um, He's the Hulk because he found a way to suck the gamma radiation out of the Hulk and he took it into himself. And Nanobites and science. Yes. Basically, he saved the world like you do when you're a superhero. So <coughs> go check out some of the previous issues of this. Kind of get that full story. But issue 712 takes us back to the planet of Sakaar. Now, that's going to sound familiar for one of two reasons. Either you've read the original World War Hulk um, or Planet Hulk, excuse me, pardon me, that was written by Greg Pak. Um, it was drawn by a guy named Carlo Pigulian. I think that's how you say his name. Or you watch the last Thor movie where they go to Sakaar, and it's it's drawn from that. Greg Pak is taking us back there, but you're like, oh, Caleb, how is that possible? Because that planet blew up, because the ship blew up, because of the bad thing in the thing. Because um, comic physics. <laughs> because comic physics, also <laughs> because Secret Wars redid everything, and now we're back again. So... Amadeus had quarantined himself out in space because he's having some trouble controlling his inner Hulk. 
Um, he's having some trouble dealing with the fact that he thought he can control the rage monster and actually turns out, no, the rage monster is really hard to control. Um, go figure on that. It's a fucking rage monster. So he's camped out in space, um, and he gets a distress call from Sakaar, and they're looking for the original world breaker. They're looking for Banner's Hulk. Well, Banner's Hulk ain't around no more, much to my chagrin. I'm not happy about it, but it's a thing. And so he goes to Sakaar, and turns out there's been a warlord who's taken over the planet. He's not a good guy, like you can kind of expect a warlord to be, also because warlords. And he's treating people like garbage, and there's lots of sadness. And no one likes sadness, especially not little Amadeus Cho the Hulk. So he jumps into the Warlord's Challenge, and he is running the Gauntlet. Uh, the Gauntlet is a series of five battles. It's kind of a Romanesque arena-type gladiator thing. If, you wa if you've ever read the original Planet Hulk or you watched Thor, then you know a little bit about that, where they had the, the big gladiator helmet and the, the Roman influence. But he's back. So this Warlord's basically enslaved the planet. Uh, they're all of their different nomadic clans, and they've chosen Amadeus, totally awesome Hulk, to be their champion. And he has beat the first three levels, which he wasn't supposed to. The Warlord's getting all upset because his plan's not working out. And he releases his fourth champion. It's Thor Odinson. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I don't really care how Thor got there. I'm sure there's people going... <laughs> Well, no, he's doing all this stuff on Earth and outside of Earth, and he's doing all this stuff, and where's this flying goat? But no, Thor, <laughs> Thor Odinson is there, and you're like, well, he's Thor Odinson. Now, why is he the champion? Somehow, and it doesn't really explain why. Greg Pot can maybe tell us later if he ever comes on this show, or I talk to him again, because uh, I've done that once or twice. They implanted an obedience disc, which they, they went through yeah. in the first thing. They, these things have precedence. They got it on Thor Odinson, and he can't control himself, so... They throw him in the arena, and the Hulk's like, you know, hey, let's talk this out. And he's like, yeah, well, you can do that. They're Like, the car's here, but I'm not driving. I have no control, and I've got a big axe. I'm probably going to try to kill you right now. And, yeah, I'm trying to kill you right now. And so they scuffle a little bit. Some stuff goes on. There are people in the, you know, my mother was one of those people when I played sports that would sit in the stands and, like, yell out and tell me how I'm living life wrong out there on the <laughs> basketball court. Um, so the Hulk's got some of these people doing that. <laughs> and so they're all like, no, you have to let the monster out because Amadeus Cho has been trying not to do that. Even though he's in his Hulk form, he's been trying to keep that that rage monster locked up and Pac uses a really good metaphor, which is drawn really well by Greg Land. Uh, a lot of people don't like Greg Land's art. I happen to think it's great. There's some, there's some extremely cool scenes in here that he, he expertly draws out, but Pac uses this metaphor of keeping the monster locked in a trunk. And they use these really old like cars <laughs> jacked up monster machine things during these, these visual metaphors to do it. And the Hulk persona is talking to Amadeus Cho. He's he's arguing with himself, which is which is what the Hulk is about. There's a lot of people who don't who want to argue that these are not Hulk books. No, they they are. They are 100% Hulk books because Amadeus Cho is arguing with the beast inside him. There are 60 years of Banner doing that, uh, of having to of fearing what could happen if he doesn't maintain control. Uh, there, there is a quote in here that I think hits the nail on the head, and it's the Hulk dealing with these facts of, of what it is. So the Hulk says that's not the part he's scared of. You know, the part he's scared of is not numbers and consequences. That'll do whatever it takes to save the greatest number of people. That's Amadeus Cho. That's Amadeus Cho in a nutshell. He does worry about those things because he is, is a scientist. But then it goes into kind of an ethical question of if I let this beast out, he's going to kill Thor, but it's going to save an entire planet of sentient people who are innocent and don't deserve to die because Thor's about to crack this planet in half. He is a god, after all. And he may not have Mjolnir in this scene, but he's got his battle axe and he's raining down some pain. He's going to hurt people. And if they lose, if the Hulk loses all of these people, there's, it's going to be a genocide. And so it has to, you know, Amadeus Cho is dealing with this, this question of, do I sacrifice one to save many? And the answer is he doesn't choose to go left. He doesn't choose to go right. He chooses to go straight forward. He doesn't kill Odinson. I don't know if that would actually be possible or not. That's one of those questions that nerd, nerds argue all the time. Um, that is a quintessential nerd he argument. He knocks him out, knocks him down, and then rips the obedience chip off his chest. That part was lackluster to me. I'm not going to lie. That's, I, you know, Just in the spirit of honesty, when it reached that part, I like it was like a balloon with the air being let out. 
I didn't like that it was just so easy for him to reach out and pluck that away. It read like, oh, we, we got this character for one issue. We wanted to bring him over because maybe it'll bring Thor fans of this book. They'll they'll pick it up and then they can go back away again. But for a brief moment, these two these two well-known characters will collide. It also throws it back to the movie. So there's a reason for them to be in there. And everybody likes to see a Thor Hulk fight. Everyone <laughs> does. You know, at least they did get it right in the fact that Thor did, or that, that Hulk did beat Thor. They got that right because that's what would happen. Uh, yeah, fight me. Absolutely. That's what would happen. The Hulk, the Hulk is going to beat Thor every time. <laughs> um, so I did not particularly like that part of the book, but it, it was really a rich, rich story, and it was a lot of fun. So even though there was that one little element that doesn't diminish the fact that I was turning these pages as fast as I could just to see what was going on. Like I said, it's beautifully, beautifully drawn by Greg Land. The, a guy named Jay Lyston did the ink to it. Frank Diarmada did the colors, and he's actually a colorist that I've seen in several books. I think he's one of their up-and-coming colorists that is going to be a name that we see for a while. I don't know much about his history, so somebody sitting out there might be saying, yeah, no, he's been doing this for 40 years. It could be. I don't know. I'm not familiar with him. But he did a great job. At the end of the book, the warlord is upset <coughs> that his plan is not working out. He takes it out on his right-hand man, and he debuts the fifth layer of the gauntlet, which is a foe that you're not going to expect, but it does have extreme callbacks to the original Planet Hulk series, and it's going to be a neat twist. And I'm curious to see what, what Greg Pop does with it. So I'm definitely going to be picking up the next issue, which, I mean, granted, I'd be doing anyway because I'm a Hulk completist, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm actively wanting to get this. Good, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. One of my issues... Well, let me back up. I really have loved the Amadeus Cho Hulk yeah. storyline. I've really enjoyed it. But if I've had an issue is that it hasn't felt like the Hulk because where I'm at in the story, there's not a whole lot of his going back and forth with trying to control the Hulk. Wow. He's just been in control. And to me, what makes a good Hulk story is the banner not being in control. Yeah, it's his, his, his His fear that he's going to lose control and innocent people are going to die. Right. That's what makes a good Hulk story. To right. Me. It's one of the things I love about the Hulk. So the Amadeus Cho, while I've, it's been a fun, good book that I've enjoyed reading, it's felt off to me because of that. So I'm glad to see that they're actually going down that path and I look forward to reading that. Uh, yeah, when he started off this book, he made it a really good Amadeus Cho story first, which was a decision that he made. And now he's making it a good Hulk story uh, and, and bringing those two things together. So uh, Sounds good. Always been hearing some, like, obviously some people don't like Amadeus Cho as Hulk because it's not been a typical Hulk book. But... And you as a Hulk fan might disagree with this or not. And I do like the Hulk, but I wouldn't call myself like a super fan. Right. A lot of people say it's like the reason like they claim they're not going to do another Hulk movie because it's hard to write Hulk because it's all the same story over and over again. But there are interesting ways to take it, and this is a different route. Right. I mean, much like Planet Hulk, where he, he was Hulk 95% of the book, and it showed us another side to the Hulk character, the Hulk beast itself. So... I don't know. Like, change is always scary for fans, but I've been hearing mostly good about this book. Yeah. Also, it's comic books wait five minutes. Right. Yeah, it's not going to be all told in no, one story. Right. <laughs> I was really like, what? What, what is that? <laughs> and I, and I, I love took, Banner, and I can't wait to see him back, but it's comic books wait five minutes. Right. Let people tell their stories. Right. right. Absolutely. So, what'd you read this week? I read a book actually recommended by Craig. May have heard a blurb about this book, but I forgot all about it. Craig was like, this is right up your alley, and he is absolutely correct. Uh, I mentioned it in the last episode of what I was looking forward to reading next week. It is called Hungry Ghosts. It was written by Anthony Bourdain, a guy from uh, No Reservations and a few other travel shows, mainly about food of different places that he enjoys. Uh, this is uh, Ghost Stories. This book has two different stories. I'm not going to get into too much detail because you know no one likes, even though we do say spoiler, 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 as a horror fan, I can't give away the story. I just can't do it. But what you need to know is that it is food-centric, the, the tales do kind of sit around some food as a, a bit of inspiration. And I'm not, like I said, they take interesting takes on it. The, the basic premise, though, is that it's taking an old uh, samurai tradition. What they would do after coming back from a war or hanging out in, a, in an inn drinking was that there was apparently a game they would play where they tell ghost stories. Like, and this is like in the feudal era, so this is all they had to do at night besides drink sake and you know, scare each other with ghost stories. <laughs> but there was a challenge they would do because they were men of honor and bravery. 
is they would tell a scary story. And then one samurai had to go into a room that was lit with like a whole bunch of candles. And each time they go in there, they put out one candle and have to look in a mirror to make sure they weren't possessed by an evil spirit. And you know, and back then that was a real fear, especially when you work around death so much that there were ghosts haunting you. So, but as the night progressed, more sake was poured and drunk. They were getting drunker and drunker, telling scarier and scarier stories to the last samurai. And they put out that last little light in an all dark room. They said they usually chickened out. So it was just a little game they did. And this is kind of inspired by that tale. To where they're all they're like, there's a group of people meeting up in modern time, and they're going to tell ghost stories, and, and they're just already early on they're showing there's supernatural elements involved. Really good, uh, published by Dark Horse Comics. You know, like, it may not be the big three or the big I don't know how many big numbers are supposed to be, but Dark Horse, <laughs> Dark Horse is definitely number it's a four. No name. It's, yeah. well, I guess it would be. I'd say it'd be number four, four. or five. Yeah, yeah. in sales. They're they're a big fan. There's a book they publish. I'll get into in a different episode that I'm a huge fan of that. That's for another time. But yes, Hungry Ghosts. If you like ghost stories, it's the arts. Very stylized, very good. And it's Anthony Bourdain writes a damn good comic. I was really surprised. I didn't know how good of a writer he is. I, I read one other book by him. Well, I think he's teaming up with another writer to do it, is he not? Uh, let me double um, check in here. Uh, oh, yes, yeah. He is writing with uh, Joel Rose. Okay, yeah. And there's uh, But there are art. Like, each of the stories has a different artist to it as well, so you get a compilation of artists yeah. in there. and that's not to take anything away from Mr. Bourdain, um, the, but in the past, there have been big-name people um, who aren't particularly comic writers, and comic writing is different than regular writing. So, you know, guys like Ta-Nehisi Coates, when he wrote his first comic script, he's a prose writer. They teamed him up with a comic writer so that he can understand scripting. Um, they did the same thing with CM Punk. They teamed him up with a, a comics writer, when, and now he's doing it by himself. So Brian, it's, yeah, it's just something to, to to get them into the thing. And like I said, that's not to take anything away from him, because he you know he seems to have written an amazing book that you thoroughly enjoyed. Well, dude, it was a very good book. And uh, there's an interesting blurb in the back about how uh, Joel Rose met Tom or uh, Tony, uh, Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. To, to, yeah, well, he get close. Him, I'm get close. close. He's Tony. He well, actually, him they, Tony. they call him Tony in the back. Yeah, so I was just reading. It, <laughs> he, probably all call, he probably goes by yeah. Tony. Yeah. But Anthony, how he met Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I'm just going to jump straight into it because uh, he had already been kind of publishing some stuff. But uh, he goes, and then one day, not long after that first issue in the mail, unsolicited, I got this manuscript. It wasn't fiction, which is what I was publishing, but a comic. I looked at it. The art sucked, <laughs> but the writing was good. I dropped the guy a note, and one day he showed up. A tall dude, if I could judge, had just scored. He looked and sounded high. Tony Bourdain. <laughs> yeah. Who has been that's, that's very open book. about his drug issues in the past. <laughs> <laughs> that's in the book? That's that's the very back. He's right about how, how this all came, came to be, how he met Anthony Bourdain. I love comics. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, yeah, check it out. Hungry Ghosts, if you like ghost stories and scary comics. I, I definitely will check it out. Your knowledge of Japanese culture just never ceases to Ever. Amaze. You're like, <laughs> it, it's, uh, he's got a depth of knowledge when it comes really to does. that culture. I know some things. <laughs> <laughs> so my book, much like Sean's, is the one that I pimped for this week. Well, I think we all did that this week, yeah. which is not always going to happen, but yeah. it just worked out that way. This week, it did work out that way. Motherland's number one, written by Cy Spurrier and art by Rachel Slott and Eric Kimete. I don't know. I probably butchered that name, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, it's a six-issue miniseries from DC. It centers around interdimensional bounty hunters. Particularly one is she is out hunting prey. She runs into her prey, and he starts goading her about her mother that he recognizes who she is from her likeness to her mother. Her mother was a re reality television star <laughs> that was a bounty hunter on a bounty hunter re reality TV show. The worst kind of people. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, he goads her telling him, you know, next time you see your mom, tell her how I rubbed a blister on myself watching that one episode, you know, the one I'm talking about and just kind of... Wow. Yeah. Wow. It, honestly, you know... The, I found the book to be really well drawn, but kind of bleh, until the mother shows up in the book. And she is a complete and total smartass. From that moment on, the book was just fantastic. So, it, I, it again, it's only six issues. I don't know where it's going. I don't know if it will hold my interest or not. But as of right now, I'm looking forward to see where it ends. 
That sounds really, really it, good. Yeah, I mean, it's it was just a fun read. So, all right, guys. Well, we are about to wrap this up. But before we do, we want to jump into a little segment we have decided that we like calling Getting Ahead of Ourselves. <laughs> so, I want to get ahead of myself by telling you the book I'm looking forward to next week. I, I know. Shut up. <laughs> don't don't say things. I made a decision. So what getting ahead of ourselves means is that we're going to tell you about books that are coming out in this next week that we are looking forward to. Yes. So I want to get ahead of myself by saying I'm looking forward to the Swamp Thing Winter Special number one from DC Comics. It's written by Tom King and Lean Ween, the, the late, great Lean Ween. Um, and it's drawn by Jason Fabuk and Kelly Jones. It's just a it's a, it's a one shot it's a winter special about Swamp Thing that I really enjoy and also Tom King. I'm gonna go next because my book also features Swamp Thing, and it is uh, Young Monsters in Love. Instead of being a winter book, it's a Valentine's Day special put on by DC. Oh, and I don't know anything about it. I don't normally buy into these. I buy the book because I'm a collector. But I don't normally buy the uh, buy into the hype for these special books. But uh, it's written by Paul Dini um, with Guillaume March and Kelly Jones. Again, it's published by DC. The thing about this book that's drawing my attention is the cover with Swamp Thing kissing the bride with Frankenstein walking in in the background. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, who knows? Awkward. Yeah. So, and I know his name's not Frankenstein, but in DC Universe, his name's Frankenstein. I believe it's called the Monster, Craig. Or Adam. Shut up. <laughs> it is Adam. It, uh, it's both. That's fair. Yeah. He, he chose the name Adam later mm, because he right. was the, the first. <laughs> so, yep. that's my book. Well, so the the segment's called Getting Ahead of Ourselves. I got extremely ahead of ourselves last time we recorded and told the future. Chur, chur, chur. <laughs> so I'm just going to reiterate because my picks next week haven't changed. Savage Dragon versus the Savage Sex Dolls. That's still a thing. That's not going to change. It's not, and I cannot wait to read it Wednesday. Uh, as well as Batman, next issue of Batman with uh, Super Friends. We're going to find out what happened with Wonder Woman and him and The Gentleman. And, of course, it'll be Batman White Knight. It comes out next week as well. Yeah. And, again, an amazing Joker story. It's very interesting. I'm digging the hell out of it. Caleb, I know you said you were kind of cooling on the book. I don't know if you've read, if you've gotten caught up fully. I am. Uh, it's it's It started off really strong. It's kind of slack for me. Um, the art's still amazing. Story-wise, it's, it's deflated for me a little bit. But, yeah. you know, lots of things do that in the middle, and I, I'm... I'm more than willing to edge my bets that it's going to pick up and right. finish strong. Um, Indeed. So I'm excited. But, yeah, those are my top three for next week. Yeah. Those are good picks all around. Well, are we ready to bring this thing home? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, let's do it. Thank you so much for giving us the last, uh, call it, hour and a half, almost two hours of your time. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to us. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. If not, try next time because you might like it then. Uh, we, I was going to say something smart ass there, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> please, please, please leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you have found us at, if they allow you to, to leave a review or give us a little rating. It not only lets us know how we're doing, gives us some constructive criticism on how to do things better, but it also kind of expands our reach. Like I always say, you know, the higher our rating is, the more people will see us, and that's always good to spread us out there. Um, we're, you know, this podcast is free. We always want it to be free, but we want to reach as many people as possible just because we enjoy it. You can find us once again on Twitter. We're at SFG Podcast. You can email us your questions, your comments, or your concerns, southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. Um, and come back for more. We've got some more stuff planned. Uh, we've got some big things coming down the pipeline. We've got plans for some really fun books, uh, fun topics that range from a number of things that we're really excited about talking about. So other than that, does anybody have any last little things they need to do? No. Good. All right, cool. Go forth and love comics. <laughs>